قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين. And now we will move on to the second great Imam that Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al Razi has mentioned in his book Taqdimatul Marifa, who is the Imam of the second largest center of hadith studies of that time, Makkah, the great Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So we start now the biography of this great Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna with his name. He was Abu Muhammad. This is his kunya, Abu Muhammad. Sufyan ibn Uyayna ibn Abi Imran. Sufyan ibn Uyayna ibn Abi Imran. And this was also the kunya of his grandfather, Abu Imran. His name was Maymun. Sufyan ibn Uyayna ibn Abi Imran, Maymun al Hilali. He is from the tribe of Al Hilal. Al Kufi, Thumm Al Makki. His original, his, oh, he is originally from the city of Al Kufa in Iraq. And then he relocated to Mecca where he resided for the remaining of his life until he passed away, Rahimahullah. He is the great Imam Al Imam Al Kabir, Hafiz Al Asr, the greatest of the memorizers of hadith of that time. Sheikh Al Islam, he is also labeled to be from the Sheikh Al Islam, and he is from the great scholars of the Atbaw Tabi'een and the Imam of the city of Mecca, of Ahl Mecca, of the people of Mecca. As we mentioned, he was born in Al-Kufa, in Al-Iraq, on the 15th of Sha'ban, in the year 107 after the Hijra. 107 after the Hijra. And he relocated from Al-Kufa to Mecca in the year 163 after the Hijrah. He relocated from Kufa to Mecca in the year 163. And as we mentioned, he took residence in Mecca and resided in it until he passed away. Until he passed away, close to a period of 40 years, as we will mention when the uh, topic of his death comes, inshallah. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he sought the knowledge of Islam and the knowledge of Hadith, he started seeking this knowledge from a very young age, just like Imam Malik, rahimahullah. So he started seeking the knowledge of Hadith in the year 119 after the Hijra. This was the first year that he, that he started seeking the knowledge of Hadith, that he started attending the gatherings of Hadith, of the scholars of Hadith, to learn and then to memorize and then to collect their ha hadith. So we mentioned that he, ha he was born in 107 and he started seeking this knowledge uh, when in the year 119, meaning he was only uh, 12 years of age. He was only 12 years of age. Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj from the great Imams of Iraq, of Baghdad in that time, and we will also present his biography in this series. He says, رَأَيْتُ بْنَ عُيَيْنَا غُلَامًا مَعْهُ أَلْوَاهٌ طَوِيلًا عِنْدَ عَمْرِ بْنُ دِينَارِ That I witnessed Sufyan ibn Uyayna as a young child, as a small boy. He had in his possession large scrolls of paper, and he would attend the gatherings of Amr ibn Dinar the great Imam of the Tabi'een of Mecca. In this young age, he would attend the gatherings of this great Imam, and he gathered and memorized and preserved this hadith. So he met these great Aimma in a young, at a young age, and he 
gathered and collected and preserved their hadith and he memorized it and reached the highest level of reliability in it and he lived a long period after it as we will see that this great Imam Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna he lived for a period of more than 90 years he lived for a period of more than 90 years this allowed him to attain al-ulu in his chain of narration in his isnad when he reached an older age students of hadith from all over the muslim nation they traveled to him to hear hadith from him and in order to learn a hadith and collect a hadith from him and that is why he is known as to have connected the grandfathers with the grandchildren he is known to have connected the grandfathers with the grandchildren what does that mean meaning that <coughs> he heard hadith in a young age as we mentioned then he started teaching and narrating this hadith at a young age so the grandfather he came and attended his gatherings and heard this hadith and he lived for a long period of time so this person's son also came and heard this hadith from Sufyan ibn Uyayna and to an extent that even his son, his grandson, his grandchild came and heard hadith from him. So he is the one who connected the grandchild with the grandson in narrating upon him, upon the same scholars of Islam, upon the same scholars with the ulu, the grandchild who narrated on Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he has narrated with a very short chain, with a very short chain. Even though he lives after Ibn Uyayna for a long time, but since he heard hadith from Ibn Uyayna, between him and Prophet Muhammad there are very few narrators. There are very few narrators. This is how ulu occurs. That a scholar, he starts hearing and memorizing hadith from a young age. And then he lives a long period of time. Then a student comes to him at a young age. So between him and that student, instead of 20 30 years there might be 50 60 years there might be a period of 50 60 years so this is how ulu occurs in hadith and imam ibn uyayna he unlike imam malik he traveled in the pursuit of hadith he traveled in the pursuit of hadith as we said because he was born in Al-Kufa. So in order to gather the hadith that were present in Hijaz, the first center of knowledge of hadith studies, Mecca and Medina, it was obligatory and necessary for him to travel. So he traveled to Al-Hijaz, to Mecca and Medina and other areas gathering the hadith of the scholars of those areas. So he, in terms of the quantity of narrations is more than Imam Malik. The quantity of narrations, the number of ahadith that Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna narrated and had in his possession and memorization are more than the ahadith that Imam Malik had. Because Imam Malik just had the hadith of Al-Hijaz. But Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he combined the hadith of Hijaz with the hadith of Iraq the two great centers of Islamic studies. So this is in terms of quantity. But in terms of quality, the hadith of Imam Malik are at a higher level than the hadith of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Because as we mentioned, that Imam Malik was extremely careful and diligent in narrating upon the narrators of hadith. He would only narrate on the siqat, the trustworthy narrators and this caused his hadith to be of a higher level in authenticity than the hadith of Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Of course this is just in comparison to someone like Imam Muslim. When you compare someone to Imam Muslim then you might say that Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna's hadith are of a lesser degree but Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna his ahadith, self-standing ahadith, they are all, and he was from the scholars 
who gathered authentic ahadith, narrated authentic ahadith is from the great siqat, the great reliable trustworthy narrators of the sunnah. In his travels of these, he heard the great scholars of Islam, the great scholars of hadith of that time. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna himself has reported to have said, Adraktu sab'an wa samanina tabi'iyan That I have heard hadith and I narrate hadith on 78 or 87. 87 from the tabi'in. Of from 87 from the Tabi'een. So Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna met at least 87 from the Tabi'een who he heard hadith from and narrates hadith upon. From them is Amr ibn Dinar, as we mentioned, the Imam of the Tabi'een in Mecca. The Imam of the Tabi'een in Mecca. And he is from the foremost of his students. The foremost of his students is Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Amr ibn Dinar. From the Scholars of Sufyan ibn Uyayna is Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, those around whom the chains of narrations, the Asanid, revolve. And Asim ibn Bahdala, or Asim ibn Abi Najud, or Abi Ishaq al-Sabi'i, or An Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, and countless other great scholars of hadith from the mountains of this, of this science. And Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, these were the scholars, the teachers of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. These were the teachers from whom Sufyan ibn Uyayna heard and learned hadith from. And in Sufyan ibn Uyayna heard a hadith from those scholars of hadith that no one else preserved and learned hadith from. He narrates hadith on scholars that he is the only one who has heard hadith from these scholars. Due to his keenness and his zeal and his ex effort that he exerted in reaching these scholars, and learning their hadith and preserving them. As far as his students, and just as we mentioned, that he lived a long period of time that caused the students from all over the Muslim nation to come to him, to learn from him, and that caused his number of students to increase widely. So he has students that cannot be enumerated. From the most famous of his students are some of his teachers. As we mentioned from Imam Malik, we will mention the same thing for Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He reached such a high level in the science that some of his own teachers heard hadith from him that they did not have in their possession and narrated it upon his authority. Such as Al-Amish, the great Imam of Kufa, Sulaiman ibn Mihran, Al-Amish, and Ibn Juraj, the great Imam of Makkah, Abdul Malik, Ibn Abdul Aziz ibn Juraj, and Shu'bah ibn Al-Hajjaj, these great scholars who were teachers of Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, they themselves are also his students, hearing some hadith from him and narrating it on his authority. From his well-known students are Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi and Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan and Abdul Razak al-San'ani and Yahya ibn Ma'in and a nation that cannot be enumerated from the great scholars uh, and masters in hadith. From his major main scholars who have narrated the most ahadith on the authority of Sufyan ibn Uyayna are Al Humaydi and Al Shafi'i and Ali ibn Al Madini and Imam Ahmad. These are the, the students of Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna who have narrated the most ahadith on him Al Humaydi and Al Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad and Ali ibn al-Madini. Rather, reports have come that students of hadith, students of knowledge, would specifically undertake the hardships of the travel for Hajj in order to meet Sufyan ibn Uyayna in Mecca and to learn and to hear hadith from him. A student might have made Hajj before and in those times they did not have the facilities available to them that we have today from ease and comfort. Alhamdulillah, it was a difficult, a tiring, a journey full of hardships. But these scholars of hadith, out of their diligence and zeal to hear and 
collect the hadith of Sufyan ibn Uyayna, they undertook these long, difficult journeys just in order to hear the hadith from Sufyan ibn Uyayna. As far as the scholar, statements of the great scholars in praise of this great Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna and in expounding his, his reliability and the great stature that he, that he reached in the science of hadith, then from it is the statement of his student, or from the foremost of his students, Imam Shafi'i. He says, Rahimahullah, Lawla Malikun wa Sufyan ibn Uyayna la zahaba ilmul hijaz. That if it were known, not for Malik in Medina and Sufyan ibn Uyayna in Mecca, then the hadith of Hijaz would have been lost. If these two scholars did not devote their lives and exert all these efforts, whatever Allah Ta'ala had bestowed them with from power and might and effort to preserve the Sunnah Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the hadith that were present in Hijaz, it would not have reached us. It would not have reached us. The scholar, whenever they talk about the early generations of Islam, they always mention Malik in Medina and Ibn Uyayna in Mecca. Malik in Medina and Ibn Uyayna in Mecca, which were the two biggest schools of hadith studies and presence in that time. If, if it were not for these scholars exerting their entire lives in preserving the Sunnah, we would not have this Sunnah in our presence today. Imam Shafi also says, Rahimullah, Usul al Ahkami Nayifun wa Khamsu Mia Hadith, Kulluha in the Malik illa Thalathina Hadithan, Wa Kulluha in the Ibn Uyena illa Sitata Hadith. That the foundational Ahadith around which the aspects of worship from Salah and Zakat and Hajj and Siyam and the Mu'amalat, the interactions, the buying, the selling, Nikah, Talaq, marriage, divorce, the ahkam of Islam, the rulings of Islam. These ahadith, the foundations of them are around, around 500 ahadith. Are around 500 ahadith. This is according to this great scholar, Imam al-Shafi'i, who had memorized and preserved the sunnah like many of, unlike many others had. So this is from his knowledge and his expertise that he's mentioning that the foundational ahadith around which ahkam revolve, the rulings of Islam revolve, they are 500 ahadith. They are 500 ahadith. Kulluha in the Malik. All of them are memorized and preserved, precisely preserved with Imam Malik. Imam Malik memorized and precisely preserved all of these ahadith except for 30 ahadith. He has counted, Imam Shafi has counted these ahadith from both of his teachers, Malik and Ibn Uyayna, saying 30 ahadith has not been preserved and that Imam Malik does not have in his possession. And all of them are near Ibn Uyayna, are in Ibn Uyayna's memory and possession, except for six ahadith. Except for six ahadith. This is what we just mentioned that the quantity of a hadith that Sufyan ibn Uyayna had is greater than the quantity that Imam Malik had because Sufyan ibn Uyayna compiled the hadith of Hijaz with the hadith of Iraq but Imam Malik only sufficed with the hadith of Al-Hijaz because he did not travel in the pursuit of seeking, seeking the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Imam Ali ibn al-Madini, rahimahullah, the great scholars of hadith, he mentions that qala li Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, from the students, foremost students of Ibn Uyayna, he says, ma baqiya min mu'allimi ahadun ghayr Sufyan ibn Uyayna, faqultu ya Aba Sa'id, Sufyan imamun fil hadith, qala Sufyan imamun munzu arba'ina sana, that Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, he says that none of my teachers who have taught me hadith, they remain except Sufyan ibn Uyayna. This gives proof to the long life that he attained, to the long life that he attained that caused and allowed for his isnat to reach this ulu. 
Yahya ibn Sayyid al-Qattan says, None of the teachers who taught me hadith, who I heard hadith from, are alive except Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Fakultu, yani Ali ibn al-Madini, he says to Yahya ibn Sayyid al-Qattan, Ya Aba Sa'id, that was his kunya, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, really is an imam in the science of hadith. He's an imam in the science of hadith. So Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, upon hearing this, he said, Sufyan is an imam not just today, in this age, he has been an imam for the last 40 years. He has been an imam, a reference point in the science of hadith for the last almost half a decade, for the last 40 years. Imam al-Ijli, he praises Sufyan ibn Uyayna and his, the high level of, high level of memorization and retention ability that he reached by saying, كان ابن عيينة ثبتا في الحديث وكان حديثه نحوا من سبعة آلاف ولم تكن له كتب that Imam Sufyan ibn عيينة he was really the highest reached the highest degree of authenticity and reliability in narrating of hadith he had 7,000 almost 7,000 ahadith memorized and preserved and he did not have any books with him. All these 7,000 ahadith he had preserved and memorized precisely by his heart. He did not have books in his possession. He himself says, Ibn, Ibn Uyayna, that ma katabtu shay'an illa hafidhtuhu qabla an aktubahu. That I did not need to write anything except that I memorized it before even writing it, before even writing it. This is from the blessings of Allah Ta'ala that He blessed this great Imam with in order to utilize him to preserve and protect the Sunnah from any addition, subtraction, any alteration and changes until the end of time so that it could reach the generations after him such as our generation and it will remain so until the end of times. This is a great statement for us to ponder upon. Imam al-Shafi'i, from the great Imams and the students of, foremost students of Ibn Uyayna, he says, ما رأيت أحدا فيه من آلة العلم ما في سفيان ibn Uyayna وما رأيت أكف عن الفتية منه He says that I did not meet a teacher from my teachers who had all the capabilities and sciences and knowledges of Islam combined in him than Sufyan ibn Uyayna. I did not meet a teacher who had all the facilities and sciences of Islam that, that were combined in one person more than Sufyan ibn Uyayna. But we must ponder on this next statement that he says that even with that, I did not find from my teachers anyone who was more cautious about giving fatwa than him who was more cautious about giving fatwa and speaking in the religion of Allah than him. Even with this knowledge that he possessed, he took the utmost of caution in ruling in the religion of Islam and speaking about matters in the religion of Islam out of fear of making a mistake or saying something that is not in accordance with the truth. Then we move on to the Next point that we said, the pattern we will follow, which is a mention of some of the incidents and occurrences and events that occurred during his life and some of the news that, are, that is related to his life that we can benefit from and ponder upon. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, as we said, from the foremost students of Ibn Uyayna, he says, دَخَلَ Sufyan ibn Uyayna ala ma'an ibn Zayda, يعني أمير اليمن. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ سُفْيَانْ تَتَلَطَّخْ بَعْدُ بِشَيْمٍ أَمْرِ السُّلْطَانِ فَجَعَلَهُ يَعِذُهُ فَجَعَلَ يَعِذُهُ That Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he entered upon Ma'an ibn Zayda, who was the governor of Yemen. He traveled to Yemen, so he entered upon the governor of Yemen, who, who comes next in line to the Khalifa, to the Caliph of the Muslims. Ma'an ibn Zayda. And Ibn Uyayna 
was not stained and tarnished with anything that the governor and the ruler had in his possession. So he started to admonish him and he started to advise him. This was the way of the scholars of Hadith that they refrained themselves and took great precaution in not to enter upon the rulers and the people of, of power and influence lest that their power and their influence and their money and their status influence them in leaving this path and in leaving their trustworthiness and uprightness in narrating this knowledge. So Imam Ibn Uyayna, he, when he entered upon this ruler, he started to advise him and to admonish him. And this is a very difficult position for many of the people. If they were to enter upon such a person, then they would most likely start to praise him, to, to try to attain something that Allah Ta'ala had blessed him with from status, from money, from position. But the Salaf, the scholars of the Salaf, they, their whole goal was to convey the knowledge of Islam to everybody regarding or regardless of his status and of his position. From this also we, uh, we learn another benefit that this is the methodology of the Salaf in advising the ruler, the ruler of the Muslims and the people in authority, then they are to be advised in secret meetings, private meetings behind closed doors. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he did not climb the member and started advising and rebuking and criticizing the ruler. Rather, he entered upon him and he privately, secretly advised him. This is the way of all of the scholars of the Salaf and this was their methodology in order to safeguard the peace and safety of the communities. From the news and the stories that have occurred that we can ponder upon is what Ibn Uyayna said that Ra'aytu ka anna asnani saqatat fa dhakartu dhalika li zuhri fa qala tamutu asnanuka wa tabqa anta that Ibn Uyayna he saw a dream he saw a dream that all his teeth had fallen, up, fallen down had fallen down so he mentioned this dream to one of his great teachers and scholars, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. So Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, he explained this dream to Ibn Uyayna by saying that this means that your teeth will fall, they will die, but you will remain alive. Meaning you'll reach a long life. You'll reach an age where your teeth will fall your teeth will die, but you will still remain alive. So he says, Ibn Uyayna, فَمَاتَ asnani wa baqitu ana." So it happened just as he said. My teeth all fell away. I reached that age, but I remained alive. فَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ كُلَّ عَدُوٍ لِي مُحَدِّثًا He mentioned that Allah Ta'ala, He made all of my enemies, the students of hadith. He made all of my hadith, uh, st enemies, the students of hadith. Imam al-Zahabi, when he narrated this statement of Ibn Uyayna in Seer Alam al-Nubula, he says, هَذَا مِنْ شِدَّةِ مَا كَانَ يَلْقَى مِنْ إِزْدِحَامَ أَصْحَابَ الْحَدِيثِ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يُبْرِمُوهُ That he said this and his teeth fell out of the exhaustion and the tiredness he felt by way of the students of hadith constantly, constantly returning to him and asking him to narrate hadith to him. They never left him. They never left him. So this caused him to become old before reaching old age. And this caused him to become tired and exhausted. And this is why he labeled them as his enemies, because they have resulted in the deterioration of his health. 
And there's a great story that gives proof to this. Suleiman ibn Matar, he says, Kunna ala bab Sufyan ibn Uyayna, fasta'zanna alay falam ya'zan lana. Fakulna udkhulu hatta nahjum alay. Qala, fakasarna babahu wa dakhalna wa huwa jalis. They say that we were outside the house of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. We were standing at his doorstep. And we asked him to grant us permission so we can come and hear a hadith from him and seek the knowledge of hadith from him. So Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna did not give them permission. Did not give them permission at that specific time. So the, he said that let us enter with force. So we broke down his door and entered his house. So we broke down his door and entered his house forcefully. So we found him sitting down. فَنَذَرَ إِلَيْنَا So he looked at us. فَقَالَ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ دَخَلْتُمْ دَارِي بِغَيْرِ إِذْنِي وَقَدْ حَدَّثَنَا زُهْرِي He said, Subhanallah, you have entered my house without seeking permission, forcefully, verily, Imam Az-Zuhri, his teacher, Ibn Shihab, he narrated on so and so and so and so, then he narrates the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, he was once in his house, and he saw that a person was peeking through one of the holes, looking into the house. And the Prophet ﷺ, he had a midra, a midra meaning a long, uh, uh, long uh, comb. Uh, it, it is similar to a comb, but it's longer in length. He had that with him. So he said that, if I, law alimtu annaka tanzuruni, la ta'antu biha fi aynaik. That if, if I knew that you were peeping through this hole looking at me, I would have poked you in the eye with this, with this long comb that is in my possession. This is a hadith narrated by Sayyid al-Bukhari. Hadith narrated by Sayyid al-Bukhari. So Imam Sufyan narrated this hadith based on this incident. So these students who forcefully entered his house, they said, فَقُلْنَا لَهُ نَدِمْنَا يَا أَبَا مُحَمَّدْ We are sorry, O Abu Muhammad. We are sorry, we seek your apology, we seek your forgiveness. So he said, نَدِمْتُمْ You are sorry, you apologize. حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ الْكَرِيمُ الْجَزَرِ Then he narrated another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, النَّدْمُ تَوْبَ That nadam, sorryness, is to seek forgiveness from Allah. Is to seek forgiveness from Allah أُخْرُجُوا فَقَدْ أَخَذْتُمْ رَأْسَ مَالِي إِبْنُ عِيَيْنَا Leave for really you have received what you came in for. You have received two hadith from me. You have heard two hadith from me. So this was the ex efforts that the scholars of hadith made in dedicating and devoting their lives to narrating and preserving the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. All of their life was devoted to this. They went through such hardships in order to ensure that the sunnah was precisely preserved and that it could remain preserved until the end of times. This sunnah, this hadith of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, it did not just reach us without these great efforts being undertook and these sacrifices being made by these great scholars of hadith. We will finish with this, uh, this point. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he once showed Harmala ibn Yahya, one of his students, he showed him khubz sha'ir, a bread of barley, bread made of barley, which was the cheapest and the lowest quality of bread available at that time. And he said, هَذَا تَعَامِي مُنذُ سِتِّينَ سَنَةً Verily, this is what I live off and this is what I feed myself with and I survive for, I have been surviving upon for the last 60 years. For the last 60 years. This is their dedication and sacrifice. They had nothing from the wealth of this dunya. And they left off everything. If they wanted to, they could have gathered all the wealth they wanted in this world. But they left off all r relaxations and all the benefits and all the comforts of this worldly life in order to sacrifice and dedicate themselves to the preservation of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I think we should take a break here inshallah and we'll continue after the break if someone has any questions yeah have you ever broken any doors or jumped over anyone <laughs> <laughs> times have changed <laughs> <laughs> 
So we return back to the biography of this great Imam, the Imam of the Atbaw Tabi'een in the city of Mecca during his time, Sufyan ibn Uyayna. We will start now with the discussion regarding his aqidah, his etiqad, his belief system, his creed that as we mentioned before for Imam Malik and we'll mention for the remaining a'imma that all of them are unified in their creed. These Imams, they have no difference amongst themselves regarding matters of the creed. And this is the creed of the Ahlul Hadith. This is the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is the creed of the Salaf al Salih, the, the righteous predecessors that it is obligatory upon the Muslims to follow uh, in this creed. Imam al Zahabi, Rahimullah, he says in his book, Seer Alam al Nubula, that Kana Sufyan, Rahimullah, Sahib Sunnah wa Tiba'ah, that Sufyan ibn Uyayna was in his creed and in his acts of worship in, in rulings pertaining to Islam he was a person who followed the Sunnah and who made ittiba of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna he has this great statement expounding upon his creed that Imam Al-Lalikai he narrated upon his authority in his great book Shar Usul Atiqad Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'a he says that a sunnatu ashara that the sunnah is 10 things or comprises of 10 things this is one of the utilizations of the word sunnah near the scholars of hadith the scholars of hadith sometimes they use the word sunnah to mean etiqad to mean matters of creed that matters that are unified upon, that they are from the way or, and methodology of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this led birth to the books that we have in front of us or with us that are known as Kutub As-Sunnah. Kutub As-Sunnah, such as the Sunnah of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Sunnah of Ibn Abi Asim and other books. These do not mean the sunnah of the books of Sunan Abi Dawood, for example, or Sunan al Nasai. Those sunan, those books have been authored to gather the ahadith of al ahkam, the rulings of Islam. These books, Kutub al Sunnah, have been authored to gather ahadith pertaining to the creed, to matters of belief. So, Imam Ibn Uyayna, he says, a sunnah to ashara, that the matters of the creed, the foundational matters of the creed are ten matters. فَمَنْ كُنَّ فِيهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ السُنَّةِ وَمَنْ تَرَكَ مِنْهَا شَيْئًا فَقَدْ تَرَكَ السُنَّةِ That the one who believes in all these three matters, all these ten matters, he has completed the sunnah. He has completed the sunnah, meaning he has believed in the proper creed according to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad and the one who leaves from these matters a single matter then he has rejected the entire Sunnah he has rejected the entire Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad what are these ten matters? Isbatul Qadr believing in Qadr believing in the pre-destiny and decree of Allah Azza wa Jal and with this he has refuted the groups that arrived and that arose in those times, the Qadariya and the Jabariya. The Qadariya and the Jabariya who had two opposing beliefs regarding Qadr and the Ahlul Hadith and the Ahlul Sunnah and the Salafis, they are in the middle of these two extremes. Taqdeem Abi Bakr wa Umar to believe that the best of this Islamic nation is Abu Bakr, then Umar. Then Umar, and this is also in refutation to the groups that arose that are present amongst us today, such as the Rafi, the Shia, and other than them, that give precedence to Ali over Abu Bakr and Umar. The third matter is Al Hawd, the river or the pond or the lake that Allah Ta'ala 
will grant Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the hereafter and a shafa'ah that the Prophet وسلم, will intercede for the Muslims, the people who died upon Tawheed, upon the oneness of Allah on the day of judgment and al-mizan that there is a scale that will weigh the good and evil deeds on the day of judgment and a sirat that there is a bridge that will be put over hellfire jahannam that everyone has to cross over wal imanu qawlun wa amal that iman it is both speech and action it is both speech and action wal quranu kalamullah that the Quran is the speech of Allah. Wa azabul qabr, and to believe that the punishment of the grave is the truth. It is a reality. Wal ba'athu yawm al qiyamah, and to believe in the resurrection on the day of judgment. Wala taqta'u bi shahadati ala muslim, and not to rule upon any Muslim to be from, the, from paradise or from hellfire not to rule upon any specific Muslim to be from paradise or, or from hellfire this is also from the aspects of the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah of Ahlul Hadith that they do not rule upon a specific person from the Muslims that he is in paradise or he is in hellfire rather the one who passed away upon righteousness then they hope then they hope and wish and make dua to Allah Ta'ala that he be from the people of paradise and the one who passed away on a state of sinning then they fear for him and they make dua to Allah and wish for him that Allah Ta'ala forgives him forgives him uh, his sins so these 10 aspects expound upon the creed of Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna and as we can see this creed is in accordance with the creed of the great scholars of the Salaf. Imam Ahmad ibn Nasr or Ahmad ibn Nasr he says Sa'altu ibn Uyayna wa ja'altu ulihha alayhi faqala da'ani atanafas that I started asking ibn Uyayna and I started asking him a lot of questions so he told me let me breathe let me let me breathe فَقُلْتُ كَيْفَ حَدِيثِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْمِلُ السَّمَاوَاتِ عَلَىٰ إِسْبِعِ That tell me regarding the hadith which is a muttafaqun alay hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim in the Sahihin that Allah Ta'ala He will carry the seven the seven heavens on his finger on the day of judgment and he will carry the seven earths on his finger on the day of judgment this is a hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim and he said hadith inna quloob al-ibadi bayna usbu'in min asabi' ar-rahman the hadith this is also narrated by Imam Muslim in his Sahih that verily the hearts of the people are between the two fingers from the fingers of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he asked him regarding this ahadith. So Sufyan, Faqala Sufyan, Hiya kama jaat. Nuqirru biha wa nuhaddithu biha bila kayf. They are as they have been narrated and as they have been revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah on its apparent meanings. We believe in them, we accept them, and we relate to others without asking how and kayf without asking how usbu it has a meaning in the arabic language in the language that allah ta'ala revealed the quran and the sunnah to the bedouins to the arabs who did not read and write he 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 addressed them in a language in a clear simple language that they could understand he has revealed this quran and sunnah as guidance for mankind until end of times so when Allah Ta'ala has revealed these words, they have meanings that, that they understood and that we understand. This was the reason that Allah Ta'ala revealed. He did not reveal a, a speech that is vague, that is unclear, that we do not know the meanings of. So when Allah Ta'ala says in this, uh, the Prophet informed us regarding Allah that 
in this ahadith that he has fingers, they have a meaning. But how these fingers are, the kafiyah, then we do not know. How these attributes of Allah Ta'ala are, then we do not know. From them is the statement of his student, Imam Al-Humaydi. He says, Qila li Sufyan ibn Uyayna, inna Bishran al-Marisi, that Bishr al-Marisi, this was one of the great trials and tribulations of that time. This person, he was from the students of Ibn Uyayna and other scholars of Hadith. But Allah Ta'ala chose to misguide him. And he got misguided and he became from the foremost leaders of the misguided sect of the Mu'tazila. The misguided sect of the Mu'tazila that deny the attributes of Allah Ta'ala in the Quran and the Sunnah and say that these attributes that have come in the Quran and Sunnah they are words without meaning they are words that we have no knowledge about their meanings so he was asked about Bishr and Marisi that he says inna allaha la yura yawm al qiyamah that Allah Ta'ala he, he cannot be seen on the day of judgment he cannot be seen on the day of judgment so he said Sufyan Uyayna قَاتَلَهُ اللَّهِ أَلَمْ تَسْمَعْ إِلَىٰ قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَىٰ كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ That may Allah destroy him, Bishr al-Marisi. Do you not ponder and reflect upon the statement of Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an? Verily, on that day, on the day of judgment, the disbelievers, those who denied the resurrection, they will be shielded from viewing Allah Azza wa Jal. He says, فَإِذَا اِحْتَجَبَ عَنِ الْأَوْلِيَاءِ وَالْعَادَىٰ فَأَيُّ فَضْلٍ لِلْأَوْلِيَاءِ عَلَىٰ الْعَادَىٰ So if Allah Ta'ala was to shield both his friends, the believers, and his enemies, the, the, the disbelievers, then what is the virtue of the believers over the disbelievers? If he were to shield both of them, if, if Allah Ta'ala will not be seen on the Day of Judgment, then what is the purpose of revealing this ayat that the believers will see their Lord on the day of judgment and the disbelievers from the greatest of their punishments is that they will be they will be prohibited from seeing Allah Azza wa Jal. And as we mentioned, this is the creed and belief of all of the Imams of the Salaf without without distinction and without difference. All of them believe in the names and attributes of Allah Ta'ala that have come in the Quran and the Sunnah on its apparent meanings without tashbih, without resembling them to the attributes of any of the creation and without asking how these attributes are taqif and without ta'til and ta'wil, without distorting the meanings or deeming these words without meanings. From the matters of creed of Sufyan ibn Uyayna that he is united with, with the other aimma is that what Walid ibn Muslim he said Sa'altu al-Awza'i wa Sufyan ibn Uyayna wa Malik ibn Anas an hadhi al-hadith fi sifat wa ruya faqalu amiruha kama ja'ad bila kayf Walid ibn Muslim said he asked al-Awza'i and ibn Uyayna and Malik ibn Anas the three great scholars of that time uh, uh, regarding these ayat and ahadith that have come with the attributes of Allah Ta'ala and the attribute of Him being seen on the Day of Judgment. So all these great Imams, al Awza'i and Ibn Uyayna and Malik Ibn Anas, they said, believe in them in their apparent meanings and do not ask how. Do not ask how. Abdul Razak al Sanani from the great scholars of Islam who has his great book Al Musannaf, Musannaf Abdul Razak, which is present amongst us, he says, Samir to Sufyan al Thawri, Wabna Juraj, Wa Malik ibn Anas, Wa Ma'amar ibn Rashid, Wa Sufyan ibn Uyayna Yakulun, Inna al Imana Kaulun, Wa Amalun Yazidu wa Yanqus. I heard these great scholars of the Salaf, Al Thawri, Ibn Juraj, Malik, Ma'amar, and Ibn Uyayna. All of them were unified in saying that Iman is statement and action. It increases and it decreases. It increases and it decreases. This is refutation to the two misguided sects that arrived in this matter of Iman. The Murjia and the Khawarij. 
the Murjia and the Khawarij. From the methodology of these great Imams of the Salaf is that with believing and propagating this creed, the creed of the Ahlul Hadith, the creed of Ahlul Sunnah, the creed that has come in the Quran and the Sunnah, they also warned the Muslims from the people of innovation, the people of misguidance, those who have deviated in these matters of, of creed uh, and have deviated from the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. From that is his statement, he says, Man shahida janasata mubtada lam yazal fi sakhatillah hatta yarja. That whoever attends the janaza prayer of a person of innovation, then he remains in the anger of Allah Ta'ala until he leaves that janaza and returns from it. Yani, meaning that they did not just be, they did not just warn the Muslims and told them to take caution, beware from the people of innovation in the lifetime. But even after their death, even after their death, they warned the, the Muslims, the people of the Sunnah, from attending the gatherings where the people of innovation uh, gather. Qala Abdul Samad. سمعت سفيان بن عيينة يقول لي رجل من أين جد سفيان بن عيينة he asked one of the people where have you come from قال من جنازة فلان that I have come from the janaza of so and so قال سفيان لا أحدثك بحديث سنة لا أحدثك بحديث سنة that when he heard the name of that person he said really I will not narrate to you hadith for a complete year, for an entire year, out of anger for hearing the name of this person who this person attended the janazah of. فَاسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَعُودِ Seek the forgiveness of Allah and do not re return to such an action. نَظَرْتَ إِلَىٰ رَجُلٍ يَشْتُ مَسْحَابَ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم فَاتَّبَعْتَ جَنَازَتَهُ He asked him, did you not know that this person is one who curses the companions of Prophet Muhammad he is one who curses the Sahaba of Prophet Muhammad and even after that you followed his janazah, you attended his janazah, I will not narrate hadith to you for a complete year. From the great examples and role models these aimma are for us in these matters of creed is that no matter what the majority is and no matter what the overwhelming number of Muslims believe in today and they do it is upon us to safeguard the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah no matter how little we are no matter how less we are he says Sufyan ibn Uyayna Usluku sabil al-haq wa la tastawhishu min qillati ahlihi that stay firm upon the path of guidance upon the path of the Quran and the Sunnah upon the path of truth and do not become worried and concerned with it, the small number of his adherents. We do not become worried and concerned with the small number of its adherents. For verily Allah Ta'ala does not judge a person with its quantity Rather, the people of the haq, the truth, are always, were always less in number and will remain always less in number. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned in authentic ahadith that this Islamic nation was split into 73 sects. And only one of them will be the safe, thus guided, rightly guided sect. So, this shows that 72 of the sex, the majority will be upon a path of misguidance and only very little, very few people will be guided by Allah Ta'ala to this path, to the path of the Salaf. Then we move on to his ittiba, his following of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in his daily rituals and acts of worship such as Salah and Zakat and Hajj 
and Siyam and other than them. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Ishaq ibn Abi Israel, he says, Sameetu Sufyan ibn Uyayna, wa dhukira indahu Hamad ibn Zayd. Faja'ala yu'azzimu min amrihi, thumma qal, yarhamuhu Allah. Innahu kana la muttabi'an li sunnati nabiyihi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qala Sufyan, milakul amri al-ittiba'a. That he was in a gathering where Hamad ibn Zayd, that we just mentioned previously, who was from the Imams of the Muslims in Al-Basra of that time. He passed away before Sufyan ibn Uyayna in the year 179 after the Hijrah. So Hamad ibn Zayd was mentioned in one of the gatherings. So Sufyan ibn Uyayna began to praise him and began to make dua for his mercy from Allah Azza wa Jal. And he said, Verily he was a muttabi', a follower of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he said, Milakul Amri al ittiba Verily the crown jewel of the matter of the religion of Islam is al ittiba is following the Quran and the Sunnah. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, as we alluded to, he was from the great scholars of Tafsir. Abdullah ibn Wahab, rahimahullah, he says, La alamu ahadan alama bi tafsir al Qurani bi ibn Uyayna, that I do not know, I have not met a teacher, a scholar, who had more knowledge about the tafsir of the Quran than Ibn Uyayna. Than Ibn Uyayna. When Ibn Uyayna was asked regarding this statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءَ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا That the one who follows Allah and His Messenger, then they will be with the, in the companions, they will be blessed with the companionship of the prophets in paradise, and the truthful, and the martyrs, and the salihin, the righteous. And this is the best of companionship. So he was asked, this great Imam of Tafsir, from the greatest of the Imams of Tafsir, who are the Salihun that are mentioned in this ayah? Who are the Salihun? We know the Prophets, we know the Martyrs, but who are the Salihun, the righteous? So he says, as salihuna hum ashabul hadith. The Salihun, the righteous, are the people of Hadith. Ada'hlul hadith. In this is a great refutation by this great scholar of Islam, from the greatest of the scholars of Islam, great scholar of the Sunnah and, and, the, and the Quran and the Sunnah, that the methodology of the Ahlul Hadith, it is a methodology in, in belief and in speech and in action. It is not just a terminology that is used for the scholars of hadith. There is a misconception that is spread that the Ahlul Hadith are just the scholars of hadith. Those who studied hadith sciences, those who study the science of hadith, those who compile books in hadith sciences, those who narrate a hadith, meaning the muhaddithun, that the Ahlul Hadith are the scholars of hadith. And by this they wish to enter into the ranks of the Ahlul Hadith, those who are not from it from the Sufiya, from the Ashaira, and from the, all the other deviant sects, as long as that person has knowledge of Hadith and his sciences. But from this statement of Sufyan bin Uyayna, we find out that the Ahlul Hadith, the people of Hadith, then they have a methodology, they have a maslak, they have a mazhab in their belief, in their actions, in their worship, and they are the righteous people. They are the righteous people. Ali ibn Khashram, he said, Kunna fi majlis Sufyan ibn Uyayna, faqala, ya ashab al-hadith, ta'allamu fiqh al-hadith, la yaqharukum ashab al-ray, ma qala Abu Hanifa shay'an illa wa nahnu narwi fihi hadithan aw hadithain. Sufyan ibn Uyayna was in one of the gatherings and around him were students, so he told them, O students of hadith, O people of hadith, O ahlul hadith, Learn and seek the fiqh of these ahadith that you're learning. Seek the fiqh, the understanding, the jurisprudence. Derive the jurisprudence from this ahadith that you're hearing and that you're learning. Don't let the ashabu rai, 
the people of of a Rai, meaning the Hanafiya. This distinction between the Ahlul Hadith and Ahlul Rai has been present since the earliest of times. Since the earliest of times, the scholars have divided the methodologies in to derive rulings into two methodologies, Ahlul Hadith and Ahlul Rai. Ahlul Hadith are the ones who derive rulings from the Sunnah, from the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahlul Rai, the Hanafiya, they are the ones who derive rulings on the fatawa and the ara of their aima. The foremost of them being Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa has fatawa, he has rulings, he has statements, positions, ara. So they derive common denominators from these fatawa and rulings and then they do qiyas, analogy and apply it to other situations. This is the way of the Ahlul Rai. But the way of the Ahlul Hadith is to return to the Hadith, give precedence to it and to derive rulings from the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he is advising his students by saying, learn the skill and derive rulings from the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let not the Ahlul Rai let not the Ahlul Rai become heavy upon you and let you not have a need to return to the Ahlul Rai in order to derive rulings. Ma qala Abu Hanifa shayan illa wa nahnu narvi fi hadithan wa hadithan. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he has not given a fatwa, he has not given a position, a statement, a Rai, an opinion of his, except that we have in that matter a hadith or a hadithan or two hadith. We have a hadith or sunnah from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Meaning that there is no need for the Ahlul Hadith to return to the Ahlul Rai in order to derive rulings of Islam. The sunnah is comprehensive. It has rulings of all matters relating to the religion. This is also a doubt that the Ahlul Rai, the Hanafiya spread, that there is no option for a Muslim except that he returns to personal opinions and ara and fatawa of the scholars in order to worship Allah and, and follow his religion. This statement of this great Imam of the Sunnah, it shows us that there is not a matter except that in it is a hadith or more than one hadith. We will now move on to the next topic which is the statements of this great Imam that we can ponder upon and reflect Imam al humaydi his student he says Samaytu Sufyan Yaqul La tadkhulu hazihi al-mahabir bayt rajulin illa ashqa ahlahu wa waladahu wa qala Sufyan marra li rajul ma hirfatuk qala talabu al-hadith qala bashir ahlaka bil-iflas he says that these ink pods, mehbara, these ink pods, they used to carry ink pods with them to write in those times. These ink pods do not enter the house of a person except that it leaves the children and the wife of that person without, without wealth. Without wealth. And he said once to a person, ma hirfatuk, what is your profession? What is your profession? What do you do? Qala talabul hadith. I seek the knowledge of hadith. I am a talabul hadith. I am a student of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Qala bashir ahlaka bil iflas. Give tidings to your family of poverty. Give tidings to your family of poverty. These statements of the scholars of hadith show us that to seek the knowledge of hadith requires complete devotion and a person must be willing to sacrifice everything from the benefits and pleasures of this worldly life to seek this knowledge properly. And this is the extent that these scholars went to to preserve the hadith of Prophet Muhammad as we just heard. He lived for a period of 60 years eating just bread made of barley. So these 
statements give us proof of how a student of knowledge to strive himself and exert all that he has Allah has bestowed him with in order to seek the knowledge of Islam and the knowledge of Hadith. Verily a student of knowledge who is diligent, who is zeal, who exerts himself, he cannot combine this with, with wealth. With wealth. You cannot combine seeking this knowledge, this profession as Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena has said, with another profession. A person can only do one task correctly and perfectly. So if one dedicates himself to this, verily he will live a life of poverty as was the case with all of the scholars of hadith. They all lived a life of poverty. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena, he says this great say, statement saying, Man zida fi aqlihi naqasa min rizqihi. Man zida fi aqlihi naqasa min rizqihi. That whoever has been blessed by Allah Ta'ala with, with an increment in his intellect, then it will be combined with a decrease in his wealth. That whoever Allah Ta'ala increases in his intellect and his knowledge, then it will be combined with a decrease in his wealth. Giving proof to the same, same methodology of theirs to exert completely for the pursuit of this knowledge. And the one who exerts completely to a pursuit of something, then he cannot combine it with something else. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena, rahimahullah, he says, Al-ilmu iza lam yanfa'ak darrak. That knowledge that you have gained, if it, is, it does not benefit you, then it will hurt you. Then it will harm you. And from this we benefit the great importance of acting upon knowledge. Of acting upon knowledge. This effort and this zeal and diligence to learn and to study if it does not result in action, then there is no benefit of this knowledge. Rather, it is harmful for the person who has gained it. Because it will be proof for him, it will be proof against him on the day of judgment. Rather than being a proof for him. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena, he says, لَيْسَ الْعَالِمُ الَّذِي يَعْرِفُ الْخَيْرَ وَالشَّرِّ إِنَّمَا الْعَالِمُ الَّذِي يَعْرِفُ الْخَيْرَ فَيَتَّبِعُ وَيَعْرِفُ الشَّرِّ فَيَجْتَنِبُ The alim, the scholar, the learned Muslim is not the one who knows that right from wrong, who has knowledge about goodness from evil. Rather, the true scholar is the one who knows right, so he follows it. Who knows the truth, so he follows it, puts it into action, and he knows the evil. He knows the evil, so he stays away from it. He puts that into action. قال أحمد بن محمد بن أيوب اجتمع الناس إلى سفيان بن عيينة فقال من أحوج الناس إلى هذا العلم that the students of Sufyan ibn Uyena gathered around him and they asked him and he asked them who is the person who is most in need of this knowledge and we can place this question to you also who do you think is most in need of this knowledge the knowledge of Islam many of us or most of us or all of us will say the ignorant people, the people who are laymen, who do not know this knowledge. They are, they are the one who are most in need of this knowledge. But look at the great understanding of this great Imam. فَسَكَتُوا ثُمَّ قَالُوا تَكَلَّمْ يَا أَبَا مُحَمَّدْ So they did not answer. And they waited for his answer and they said, You answer us, O Abu Muhammad. قَالَ أَحْوَجُ النَّاسِ إِلَى الْعِلْمَ الْعُلَمَاء The people who are most in need of knowledge are the scholars themselves. Are the scholars themselves. وَذَلِكَ أَنَّ الْجَهْلَ بِهِمْ أَقْبَحْ وَلِأَنَّهُمْ غَايَةُ النَّاسِ وَهُمْ يُسَلُونَ Because ignorance by a scholar of Islam regarding a matter, it is highly, highly despicable and despicable. And they are the reference points for the people. And they are asked regarding matters of the religion. So they are most in need of this knowledge than others. Sufyan ibn Uyena he says, Man ra annahu khayrun min ghayrihi faqad istakbara thumma zakara iblis. These statements give proof we benefit from them. The humbleness and piety that a student knowledge should have. That a scholar should have. He should not feel and deem himself 
better and above others and look down upon the people and have pride for himself and think that he has gained something uh, uh, that allows him to uh, look down upon the people. So Fahim al he says, whoever deems himself to be better than other, uh, another or better than someone else, then he has committed al-kibr. He has committed al-kibr. He has pride with him. Thumma zakara iblis. Then he mentioned iblis, shaitan. That this kibr, pride, is the characteristic of shaitan, iblis. This was the reason that he was expelled. Expelled from, from paradise. Qala Ali ibn al-Madini, Kana Sufyan idha su'ila an shay, yaqul la uhsin. This again reminds us of Imam Malik ibn Anas. Ali ibn al-Madini says that if Sufyan ibn Uyena was asked about something that he did not know, he would say, I do not know. I do not have proficiency in it. فَنَقُولُ مَنْ نَسْأَلْ so the people would ask him, who are we to ask if you do not know? You are the Imam of the Muslims. If you do not know, then who should we ask? فَيَقُولْ سَلِ الْعُلَمَا وَسَلِ اللَّهَ التوفيق. Ask the scholars, meaning that he himself, and this is from their piety and humbleness. He is the Imam of the Muslims and he is directing his students and the people to ask the scholars and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give you understanding of this matter and tawfiq. قال أبو موسى الأنصاري سمعت سفيان يقول لا تكن مثل العبد السوء لا يأتي حتى يدعى ائتي الصلاة قبل النداء من توقير الصلاة أن تأتي قبل الإقامة that do not be like the disobeying servant who does not serve you unless you call him A obedient servant is the one who is Always serving. Do not be like the disobedient servant who does not serve you unless you call him. Come to the prayer of Allah. Establish the prayer before the Azan. You are servants of Allah. To come to Allah Ta'ala before you are called. Before you are called. For verily, revering the prayer, the Salah and holding it in high regard is done by coming to it before the iqama. Is done by coming to it before you're called to it. Before you're called to it. And we will finish with this statement of this great Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena regarding Zuhud, in which there's great misconceptions today near the Muslims as to what Zuhud is because of this matter of the religion and this terminology being hijacked by the misguided people who ascribe themselves to the way of the Sufiya, to the way of the Sufiya. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena, Imam uh, Al Musayyib ibn Wadih, he says, Su'ila ibn Uyena and his Zuhud. Imam ibn Sufyan ibn Uyena was asked regarding Zuhud. So he said, Az Zuhud fi ma harram Allah. فَأَمَّا مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ أَبَاحَكَهُ اللَّهِ The Zuhud, staying, staying far away and avoiding something, is done from that which Allah has made forbidden. Is done from that which Allah has deemed haram. As far as what Allah has made halal, then He has made it permissible for you. فَإِنَّ النَّبِيِّينَ قَدْ نَكَهُوا وَرَكِبُوا وَلَبِسُوا وَأَكَلُوا لَكِنَّ اللَّهَ نَهَاهُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَانْتَهُوا عَنْهُ وَكَانُوا بِهِ زُحَادًا That the prophets who are the greatest of the zuhad, who are the greatest of the zuhad, they married. They got married. And they, they wore clothes and good clothes and they ate and they drank and they got on to modes of transportation that were available to them. So verily, Zuhd is not by abstaining and staying away from these matters that Allah Ta'ala has made permissible. Today, the Muslims understand the complete opposite of the meaning of Zuhd. 
because the Sufiya have distorted this, this terminology and hijacked it, they, they understand zuhud to mean to stay away from what Allah Ta'ala has made halal. So a person, a zahid in their view, uh, in the distorted view of the Sufiya is the one who never gets married, who walks in the heat, he does not get on a car, on a mode of transportation, he wears the most dirtiest and most torn up of clothes, he eats the worst of food and drinks the worst of drinks. This is what Zuhud is to the Muslims today. And this great Imam is informing us that Zuhud abstaining is from what Allah Ta'ala has made forbidden. As for what Allah Ta'ala has made halal, then it is permissible just as the prophets and the messengers deemed it permissible and they are the greatest of Zuhud. There is no Zahid greater than the prophets and messengers of Allah. We will finish with the death of this great Imam, Rahimahullah, Al-Hassan ibn Imran ibn Uyayna. He says, who was, who was the nephew of this great Imam, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, so the son of his brother Imran ibn Uyayna. He says, Hajjajtu ma ammi Sufyan akhira hajjatin hajjaha sana alf wa amiya wa saba wa tis'een. That I made hajj with my uncle, with my paternal uncle Sufyan, the last hajj that he made in the year 197 after the hijrah. 197 after the hijrah. Falamma kunna bi jam fi muzdalifa wa salla istakla ala firashi thumma qal. When we were in Muzdalifa in this last hajj that we made in the year 197, he reclined in Muzdalifa and he said, قَدْ وَافَيْتُ هَذَا الْمَوْدَ ثَمَانِينَ عَامًا أَقُولُ فِي كُلِّ سَنَا أَلَّهُمَّ لَا تَجْعَلْهُ آخِرَ أَحْدِ مِنْكَ That verily, I have been blessed by Allah Ta'ala to reach this place for a period of 80 straight years. That he made hajj consecutively for 80 years. That I have reached Muzdalifa for a period of 80 years. And every year and every night of Muzdalifa when I reach it, in that hajj, I say, Oh Allah, do not make this a last hajj for me. Do not make this my last hajj. Allow me to return next year. قَدْ إِسْتَحْيَيْتُ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ كَثْرَةْ مَا أَسْأَلُ ذَلِكَ So this year, in the year 197, he did not make this dua. He did not ask Allah Azza wa Jal to return him the, the next year out of shame from Allah Azza wa Jal from the, from the 80 times that he had Asked him, فَرَجَعَ فَتُوُفْيَ فِي السَّنَا دَاخِلَ يَوْمُ So he returned and he passed away before reaching, reaching the next Hajj. Before reaching the next Hajj, he passed away on the day of Saturday, the first of Rajab. The first of Rajab in the year 198. In the year 198 after the Hijrah. We mentioned he was born in the year 107 and he passed away in the year 198, meaning he lived for a period of 91 years. He lived for a period of 91 years. Rahim Allah, Al Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Rahmatan Wasi'a, wa jazahu anna wa anil Muslimina khair al jaza. May Allah have mercy on this great Imam, Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and reward him with the best of rewards on behalf of Islam and the Muslims. Uh, with this, we have finished the biographies of these two great Imams, who were the Imams of the Atba'u Tabi'een. In these two great and most important centers of hadith studies in those times, Medina and Mecca. In Medina, Imam Malik ibn Anas, and in Mecca, Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And we will continue, inshallah, with moving to the second center of knowledge after Hijaz, Al Iraq, from our next lecture, inshallah. And we will start with the biography of the great Imam Sufyan al Thawri. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah. Uh, wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam a tasliman kathira. If there are any questions, you can ask them. Well, Shaykh, how can we understand the other books like the Tabaqat al-Hanabi that were in their Hijaz and Iraq? Yeah. How can we understand that they didn't read upon this book? So they all agreed upon these points, but sometimes the numbers are different. Yeah. And then later on in history, other scholars wrote about other issues of the people. So how do we understand that if people say, well, 
you know, this was, you know, wiping off the hoof and all these things were important in those days. No one talks about that now in terms of what we got. So how do we, as young students, acknowledge, understand that different scholars at certain times made certain things important, but now they're not talked about or they emphasize, like, Kotlin, Ramadan, but it's actually Kotlin, Ramadan, the way to kind of yeah. navigate through that. I mean, of course, the scholars of the Salaf and of Ahl Hadith, they lived in specific times, in specific situations, and in specific circumstances. So they authored books uh, and literature that addressed the issues in the times that they were alive in. So we find books of Aqidah refuting specific people that of course, without a doubt, they do not exist today, such as Bishr al-Marisi that we just mentioned from the heads of the Mu'tazila. Many of the scholars, they wrote books in refutation of him, such as Imam al-Darimi and Imam Ahmad and other than them. They spoke about specific sects and groups and innovations that arose at that time, and they addressed them and warned the people from them and completed what Allah Ta'ala had made obligatory upon them of teaching the people the sunnah and to preserving their creed. Some of those groups and sects, they might not exist today. Some of those groups and sects, they might not exist today. But the, the main mother groups and sects, they still exist and they will continue to exist. And this is in accordance with the Statement of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that Allah Ta'ala had informed him from the unseen of what was to come That this nation was split into 72, 73 sects So you have specific sects of the Murjia, of the Khawarij, of the Mu'tazila, of the Jahmiya, of the Ashaira, Qadariya, Jabariya You have splintered sects that might not exist today, they have specific names Bishr al-Marisi, he himself had a sect and people followed his madhab, al marisiya that is mentioned in the books of the Salaf. But you might not find that sect today. But his mother's sect, al mutazila the Ashaira, the Jahmiya, their beliefs are still present. And their beliefs are still present. And those beliefs systems are present. So we still benefit from these books. And we use what is in these books according to the circumstances and times we are living in. We might need to address one group in one place or one time and we might need to address another group in another time in another place. In some countries, some groups might not exist, but the other groups exist. In some times a group might rise, then it might finish and we address the other groups. Regarding the matters that the scholars have mentioned as part of the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, part of the creed of Ahlul, Ahlul Hadith, the Salafi creed, then it is obligatory upon the Muslims to believe in this creed. This creed is derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. And this creed is based upon the understanding of the best of this Ummah, the Salaf al-Saleh, the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Adbaw Tabi'een. So when the scholars talk about Mas' al khuffain wiping over the, the socks while making wudu, then this the scholars have explicitly mentioned in the matters of creed because there, this is a matter that many of the misguided sects, they deny. Many of the misguided sects, they deny. So they have included this matter in the books of creed in order to give reverence and preference to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and this became a sign of the Ahlul Hadith and the Ahlul Sunnah. Wiping over the socks while making wudu, it became a sign and a hallmark and a signpost of the people of the hadith and the people of sunnah. And it is till to this day. It is till to this day. If you make wudu, wipe over your socks, you will find some of the Muslims, they will criticize you. And they will tell you to take off your socks because out of their ignorance, they do not know that this is established sunnah from Prophet Muhammad wasallam in several of his travels and several ahadith that cannot be denied. So, alhamdulillah, this was from the hikmah, wisdom of the scholars that they included in matters in creed and they are still present and they will remain present 
until the end of times. The distinction is between Ahlul Hadith and Ahlul Rai. And this has been since day one. The methodologies of deriving rulings, uh, they differ between these two schools of thought. So Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad, they're from the Imams of the Ahlul Hadith. They're from the Imams of the Ahlul Hadith. And they might have difference of opinions in individual matters in which they might view one proof to be stronger than the other or one of the proofs might not have reached them upon a Muslim a layman general Muslim is to return back to the scholars and to ask them to give them the ruling of this matter according to the Quran and the Sunnah فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ that as the people of knowledge if you do not know but this asking should not be restricted and confined to one of these four madhahib that because I'm Hanafi or my family is Hanafi then I will only ask a Hanafi scholar and confine myself to it rather one should ask the scholars who are well versed in the Quran and the Sunnah and who will give you the ruling based on the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah. So once you reach such a scholar and he gives you the ruling, then it's upon you to take the ruling and to follow it. This is the what is resp the responsibility of a layman of a, and a general person. <coughs> to confine to the four madhahib and to blindly follow it there is no proof in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of these four madhahib and to confine oneself to them. These madhahib, they arose after the time of the Salaf, after the first three blessed centuries regarding which the Prophet ﷺ, he said, خَيْرٌ nasi qarni thumma الَّذِينَ yalunahum thumma الَّذِينَ yalunahum That the best of the people of this Muslim nation are my generation, the Sahaba. Then those who come after them, the Tabi'een, then those who come after them, the Adbaw Tabi'een. These three blessed generations, they had no evidence of these four madhahib being in existence. As we saw just from Imam Malik and Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, they followed the Dalil, they followed the Sunnah, they did Ittiba of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. They called the people to make Ittiba of Prophet Muhammad wasallam and to follow the Dalil and to go with the Dalil wherever it leads them. These madhahib came, arose after, and there are many factors for the spread of this madhahib. From the biggest of them are political factors. From the biggest of them are political factors where the rulers of the Muslim lands, they made it obligatory upon the scholars of the land to follow or at least to rule according to this madhahib to get positions in those lands. So no qadi, no imam, no alim would be given opportunity unless he was following the madhab of the ruler or the, the madhab that the ruler had Im implemented in that, in that land. So and this is the reason that led to the splitting and the differing of the ummah. And uh, alhamdulillah in all times and in all generations and eras, the scholars of the sunnah, those who followed the Quran and the sunnah, without confining themselves to a madhab, from these four madhahib they have existed and they continue to exist and today we have them in large numbers alhamdulillah and many of the muslims they are leaving these four madhahib and they follow the dalil alhamdulillah based on uh, a scholar saying that they trust that he will give the ruling according to the quran and the sunnah
Sheikh, so uh, the statement um, from the Sahab Hadith, Rahu Ahmad Hadith, yeah. I've seen it on the back of a book where they said, Qawlu Shafi wa Abu Ali. No. So, uh, yeah, it is established from them. Yeah. And we just read some of the statements from Imam Malik that uh, research and study my opinions. If they are in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah, then accept them. And if they are not, then reject them. And this is what has been narrated on the four Imams who have followed their Mazahib and the other Aimma. That when a Hadith is deemed to be authentic, then follow it. And that is my Mazhab. That is my Mazhab. Yeah. We shall establish the Salah, inshallah. وذكر فإن الذكرى تنفع المؤمنين وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون